Okay, so welcome to the second day of the bootcamp, and the focus of today is going to be InsureTech and uh, AI today. How many of you have done anything with respect to InsureTech? Are, are you in the InsureTech area? Is it new? Completely new? InsureTech is completely new. How much for how many of you is it completely new? Okay, so there are many people in the room. Uh, we have like 14, 15 people online too. So, uh, so uh, Dee is back today and he's going to be giving his insights on InsureTech. So it just so happened that, you know, we are kind of putting all these materials together and then when he sent his slides, I looked at my slides and then did an intersection and so I'm going to be, both are going to be more or less talking about the same thing, the first few slides. So I removed some of my slides, I'm going to remove some of my content and I'll let Dee uh, take, uh, Thank you, uh, uh, take the insight about that. And um, so uh, I kind of went through a couple of things. So yesterday, uh, how many of you missed yesterday's session? Okay, you missed yesterday's session. The recordings are available, so in case you want to watch it, uh, so you can go back online. So we talked about capital markets and blockchain. So today the focus is going to be insure tech and uh, AI with data, and we're going to do a demo of the first slide. Okay. So um, what is insure tech? I want to start out with a story. Uh, so last year when I got my car. Uh, First time, uh, you know, I talked to my agent and uh, she said, uh, well, here's what I can offer you in terms of you know, policy. And uh, I said, well, are there any other discounts you can give me? She said, well, you get your commuter discount, you get your dual car discount, blah, blah, blah. But then finally she said something interesting, which probably you may have been coming to. She said, uh, if you're interested, we have a new program called Enfrica, and uh, we can send you a device, you put in your car, drive for 90 days and the device is collecting your driving behavior how many times you brake how many times you accelerate you know, what's your speed etc etc collecting all this information and it can give you a discount anywhere between five and thirty percent so the minimum assured is five if you get into the program and you can go up to thirty percent right it's an offer you can't refuse get a 5% discount just by putting in this device. And uh, I just wanted to experiment. I'm a data geek, so I really wanted to experiment with this. So I said, fine, let me try out and it will give me at least a, uh, an evaluation of how my driving skills are based on the amount of discount I get. So I was also very conscious on how I drove when I got this device, tried it for 90 days. And guess what? How much did I get? Five percent. <laughs> so I got my five percent. So I was at the uh, the bottom end of the driving so behavior, I guess. Um, but apparently, people get this kind of five to thirty percent, and it's becoming a more formal program. And you go to their website, and even people who have current plans with Liberty Mutual can request a right track ship to there. In fact, they made it so seamless that you can go online. Uh, to your mobile device and download the right track app. Downloading a right track app is going to trigger a message to them to ship you the device. And you get the device, keep it for 90 days, use it for 90 days, and then send you the mail back to send back the device. And in addition to tracking your behavior and rewarding good behavior, they're also collecting a ton of data on how people's behaviors are. And what's that, what's going to let them you know what, that's going to let them basically leverage data science and machine learning skills to personalize offerings, you know, and even like penalize people to you know who haven't been driving very well and reward people who are driving really well. Right. So all these interesting products are coming up. Now um, to uh, I just kind of summarized a couple of things which are happening. In the, uh, in the insure tech space, and I'll let uh, Dee take a more comprehensive approach, and I'll get back to talking about uh, machine learning and AI. So a couple of things happening. On the corporate side of things, you know, if you're working on large, uh, in, in large insurance companies, uh, there's a lot of process automation and optimization going on. Because uh, you know, traditionally, you know, as you know, the insurance industry uh, is not kind of a leading uh, you know, uh, player in terms of adoption of technology. You have the traditional workflow, you know, you have insurance agents and you have phone calls and you primarily, you know, anytime you need a new policy, you call 
there are so many varieties of insurance products out there. Um, so that, that is kind of changing. So there's been a lot of emphasis on optimizing this process. You know, you know whenever, whenever you talk about you know, an accident, an auto accident, you know, traditionally you would get a, uh, evaluator to come down, schedule the appointment, they come in, they take the pictures, they upload. But nowadays, you know, you basically use your mobile app. Right? You just take those pictures, it's minor damage, you just take those pictures, upload it, no one shows up at your door. They're automating all these aspects. You get a mobile uh, text message that the you know, processing has started, and then finally, when the case is completed, they tell you like, you know, they're going to you know, send you any money or basically give you an estimate on how much damage is going to be. The other aspects are, you know, the way the products are being sold nowadays, uh, you know, you have a lot of players, digital players, who are basically packaging and providing different kinds of products, comparison platforms available. So it basically means that um, these entities who are creating these aggregation platforms are working with large insurance players. And there are a lot of channel partnerships happening and additional means of creating and selling products. And then um, you have newer products coming up. You know, if you can think about uh, you know, your Uber and uh, Airbnb, and all these platform products, which I briefly mentioned about yesterday, they're basically calling for newer kinds of insurance products out there. Uh, so if you're renting out your home, what kind of insurance do you typically have to get? And so that's basically creating a demand for newer products out there. And then uh, a lot of companies are kind of seeing saturation and they're kind of expanding into emerging markets. Uh, so I'm originally from India. So when you go to India, you see all these big brands and they're kind of localizing those products to the local markets out there and basically taking the need to the requirements and the needs of the local populations and the behaviors of the local populations. So there's a lot of uh, customization happening in those local things. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, you know, telematics is huge. And especially when you kind of you know, factor in all the behavior tracking, the amount of handling it takes which are out there. Um, so that's going to be a huge area of innovation on the corporate side of things. And on the consumer side of things, uh, there are multiple channels to which you can acquire products. You know, it's not to the traditional amount anymore in case you're looking for a product. The first thing you probably do nowadays is not call an agent, you probably look online on what's available. And then uh, you know, there's on-demand purchase of various products. You know, when you, uh, you know, buy travel, for example, if you're buying a, a flight ticket, then immediately you get a, an option to say, do you want to insure your plans? Or if you're buying any, uh, if you're renting a car, if you will, you immediately get, off, you get an option to say, okay, here are the various options. You don't typically have to go and then kind of you know, get all the insurance products at the, at the counter when you check. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, beyond the traditional property casualty, life, auto, kinds of uh, products out there, there are a lot of new insurance products which are uh, coming into play, especially when you, know, when you think about like, uh, gadgets, uh, when you buy a gadget, there are a lot of insurance service plans associated with that. Uh, in fact, in uh, the companies like Tesla, they basically have like, you know, like warranty plans for, for their cars. Um, so interesting products and especially with the new uh, types of uh, you know, autonomous driving and uh, other products coming out. Uh, so it's ripe for innovation. There are going to be a lot more products. Coming out this way. So I want to kind of, you know, show one case study and hand it over to Dee. Um, so this was, uh, I'll tie it back to the machine learning and AI uh, thing and uh, you know, talk about machine learning and AI. So uh, two years ago, I was teaching a machine learning and deep learning class at Northeastern University. And one of my students was working at uh, Veris Analytics. Anybody work for Veris? Uh, so Veris Analytics basically is an analytics provider. They actually uh, provide insurance, uh, a lot of data to insurance companies. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the projects, he was taking a deep learning and machine learning class. So he wanted to work on some data which the company already had. That way he could basically work when he was um, at school and also do his homework when he was at work. I wanted to blend both of them because he was taking the class in the evening and then he was working during the day. Uh, so this was basically a project he proposed. So the thing is, you know, they have satellite imagery of all the roofs, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of all the homes based on the geolocations. And uh, this is not something which is easily available. So if uh, an insurance, uh, home insurance, uh, 
provider is trying to estimate the insurance for a home in a hurricane prone area, the type of the roof is material uh, you know, information for them to basically figure out like, you know, what the insurance premium should be for that particular home. And uh, unfortunately, that data is not easily accessible just based on the location and the address. And the roof type is not uh, clear or the clean piece of metadata which is available as part of the, um, as part of the uh, data set. So apparently there are a bunch of third uh, party data vendors like Black Knight and um, you know, they uh, also have, uh, uh, if the clients choose the roofing type of their home, then State Farm offers discounts because you're providing, you're volunteering additional information. So there are some interesting ways in which you could do things. Uh, so the thought here was, uh, what in case you look at the geospatial data and the aerial view of these homes, and then build a machine learning model. So provided, providing the geospatial location, you get the imagery, the satellite imagery, you pass it through a deep learning model, and then classify the roof type. And if you can accurately do that, based on the hundreds of millions of data points which are out there, you're creating an alternative data set which you can monetize, but also provide it to insurance providers who can have reliable data and you don't have to basically you know, look for average data or you know, try to offer discounts to users. So that was kind of the plan. So uh, within a period of like four weeks, he built a deep learning model and we actually presented this at the meetup uh, uh, in 2017. He got an A in the class, obviously. And he also presented it to his company. So you can see all these innovative products coming out, uh, especially in the insurance industry. Just wanted to kind of highlight this case. And I'll show you a little more about it about the uh, uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning side of the story. Okay, I'll stop here, you know, because we're restricted with time. Uh, obviously, when we go through the full boot camp, uh, we actually have a lot more stuff. So I want to invite Deep back, sure. and uh, you know, uh, all the slides are kind of you know, in the same order. Thanks, Shri. And take it from here. Thank you. So Shri was very smart that he started with capital markets yesterday, right? That that's the more most. I'm a capital markets guy, historically, right? So. He, so we used to actually joke when I was an analyst that, you know, whatever capital markets did, banking did two years later, and insurance would wake up like five years later to that. And fast forwarding what's happening in short tech right now, I mean, some of the most interesting things that are happening in financial services are actually happening in parts of in, in, in insurance. Um, so we are, you know, for those that were not here yesterday, um, I work for Rosenblatt Securities. Uh, our managing director, Vikas Shah, is here with me. He lets me do the work uh, to sort of, you know, get the limelight and then he does the hard work of actually collecting the deals and working with all of you guys that might be working for startups that want to raise capital, which is, you know, what, how we pay our bills. Uh, but we spent the last, you know, month uh, just putting our heads down and sort of studying what's happening in the insurance space. Essentially from, you know, we do less work with carriers and more work with helping small startup companies uh, raise capital that tend to be in the financial services space. It used to be fairly strictly defined in finance, but increasingly, like you see in the insurance space, insurance is bleeding into, for example, the telematics and the healthcare space, right? Um, in financial services, you're sort of seeing payments actually emerge in other ancillary areas. The definition of finance, what's FinTech over time is expanded. So um, what I'm gonna basically talk about is I've got three or four slides to start us off just for those that may not be as familiar with insurance. Obviously we are consumers of insurance products. So we've got an auto policy, we've got a home policy, we've got a health policy. But we may not have been a business owner, so we don't know how workers' compensation works, right? How commercial insurance works, right? If you happen to own your business, you don't have a building, insurance related issues related to commercial insurance is not something that we as individuals may not be as familiar with. So I'll just sort of you know, give you a sense of how the industry is structured. And then uh, we'll spend uh, about 15, 20 minutes talking about um, where funding is going to insure tech companies. So where are all of these insure tech companies like various analytics, in fact, that uh, Sri mentioned, where are they raising capital? What parts of insurance are they raising capital? What are investors thinking about it? And I think why that's very important in the context of what's happening in FinTech is in large parts of financial services, spending in certain areas like lending and payments seems to be kind of slowing down a little bit in terms of capital going into financing startups that are in that space. And I'm using startups in a broad, broad term. 
but companies basically that are using technology innovatively to change something in financial services. In the insurance space, we're still seeing um, a lot of activity, not just at large companies, but in fact, a fair amount of smaller companies still coming onto the market. So that's a very good indication because there's a lot more interest in entrepreneurs coming up with solutions in the insurance space compared to other mature parts of financial services. So when you sort of, you know, just again, most of the stuff you kind of know, but one way of classifying insurance is simply from a consumer standpoint or a commercial standpoint, right? So do you see both, or from an institutional coverage standpoint or when you're covering enterprise? On the personal inside, you basically got auto, home, health, and life, right? Um, on the next side, I actually show you how large these sizes, these, these premiums written in these sectors are, which even to us as people that sort of cover this space all the time, to me was actually quite surprising the size or competitive size. On the commercial side, you've got property and casualty like you have on the, on the individual side. You've got workers' compensation, you've got group health and life policies, you've got new areas like cyber policy. And then, you know, uh, not to be only facetious, this crazy kind of policies that, this is all real stuff. This is actually a progressive website. This is stuff that they've covered. There's something called wedding cold feet policy. There is an alien abduction policy. Apparently you can be insured against being abducted by aliens. So I mean, just, you know, crazy fringe stuff, right? Um, but core, you're talking about personal and commercial. On the personal side, auto, home, health and life. Commercial, you can see sort of the big categories there. Now the measure of, so the relative size of these sectors, one of the you know, very good matters, measures obviously is the premiums written in these areas, right? So unlike spending by insurance carriers and technology in these areas, the premiums actually written in these individual areas is a good metric for the relative size. These are numbers as of 2018, end of the year. So I doubt they change very much. Premiums don't change that much. These are all US numbers. So right off the bat, you can see that auto insurance at $210 billion last year dominates the entire insurance space, right? And I kind of had thought that intuitively, but I didn't realize that it's, you know, two times as much as all commercial insurance, small commercial, you know, SMB insurance. It's look at the size difference between, for example, you know, the guys are talking about that term life insurance. But you're talking about, you know, a tenth or what, you know, 15% of auto insurance premium. So on a relative size, you can see that certain things that we think about are really large, but actually fairly small. Cyber insurance, you know, last year for all the talk around that, only about $2 billion, right? Nevertheless, growing at over 200%, right? Um, so on a relative scale, that's where sort of the premiums written are and the relative sizes of the different categories. Now, the reason that's important in the auto insurance space is, and we'll talk a little bit about that, if you think about some of what Sri was talking about and the most interesting things happening that you can kind of relate to that you read in the press and the newspaper every day is, you know, with all these ride sharing uh, business models emerging in transportation, you've got you know, electric cars, you've got autonomous vehicles, all of that is in the auto insurance space, right? And insurance in that space over the next 10 years, I'm not saying next two, three years, but if it's 10 years, we're gonna have some version of autonomous vehicles or greater autonomy, autonomy in the vehicles that we drive not just at a personal level for commercial trucks as well. That's all happening in the auto insurance sector, which by the way, you can see dominates in terms of premiums written in the entire insurance space. So if there's a lot of technology and business model change and driver habits change in this sector, you're talking about half the market that's subject to major change, right? So I think that's kind of interesting observation on that. Um, the other aspect of looking at it would be from the standpoint of the entire insurance life cycle. And it shows it as a circular cycle, but think of it as a linear cycle where insurance company goes out there and acquires a customer. Uh, the way insurance actually works is that there could be a mobile agreement. I'm sure you, all of you have sort of experienced this. When you talk to a broker or even an online site that you're shopping like Lemonade, you can actually have a mobile agreement with the broker. And even though the actual insurance policy is not fully in effect, which means the ink is not dry on the, on the paper, the insurance policy still actually begins. You are covered from that verbal agreement with the broker, right? So that's called quote, issue and bind. The next basically is for the, for the insurance carrier or whoever the insurance company uh, is to price and underwrite the policy, right? Which is obviously extremely important issue. And what, what Sri was talking about, whether you're underwriting roof insurance or whatever, the underwriting process is extremely important, has implications for once you sort of get the customer 
what are you pricing that premium at and making sure you're actually pricing it appropriately, right? All of the profitability depends upon the other, how well you can underwrite that. All the actuarial work happens in the pricing and underwriting phase. Then you get into now the policies in effect and claims start coming in, right? And claims need to be settled. Okay. So that's claims and settlement. And then you've got general policy administration and kind of central systems. So the books and records, the accounting, the back office, the safety, the, the, you know, keeping the lights on kind of functions. Very important, but oftentimes sort of overlooked because underwriting, acquiring the customer, claims and settlement tends to attract a lot more attention than the bread and butter central management systems. Each one of these areas, there are a number of interesting things happening. As, as Sri alluded to, a lot of the, I wouldn't say innovation, but I would say the new business model that emerged in insurance in the last three, four years have been in distribution of insurance product or customer acquisition, right? So all of these online models that you see, like Lemonade, for example, many others you can you know, help buy through the life insurance space, which are basically either aggregators or some, some mechanism, some digital vehicle for acquiring customers, right? And some firms are doing that on behalf of large carriers, so offering their solutions to local carriers to wipe them with the product. Others actually, like Lemonade, offering it directly as a business themselves. So they're not necessarily underwriting all the policies. They might have underwriters that they're partnering with, but they are using the online platform to acquire customers. That is directly going after all the insurance brokers, tens of thousands of them, I don't know, the last count was last year, but basically the entire insurance industry and all the brokers in the insurance business whose responsibility was to call up people and sell them insurance across all the insurance policies we buy. A lot of the money and effort till now has gone into that customer acquisition phase, right? We're beginning to see, which is essentially more of two thirds, three fourths of that money have been more in consumer oriented uh, consumer acquisition models. And it's beginning to see it happen in the, in the commercial side as well. But now you're seeing more activity in the downstream systems where it's pricing underwriting. So startups merging in this space, for example, the telematics guys, there is, you know, back office areas like billing, for example, or payments. You know, we, we were uh, working with uh, a company in the summer where we sort of, um, they wanted to sort of, you know, sell themselves. They were purely in the insurance payment space. And we did some work looking at just insurance payments, which is essentially premiums that the insurance carrier collects from all of us and then claims that are written out, right? And what these guys essentially were doing with their partners was to say, why do I have to wait two weeks and get a check in the mail after I've already paid for the insurance of a car to be fixed, right? I mean, certain insurance carriers will obviously write a check directly to the, the mechanic who sort of fixed your shop, fixed your, fixed your car. But in many cases, you actually incur the cost and you reimburse two weeks later. You've got to wait for a check in the mail. Every day you're waiting for the, for the check to arrive. And there's a lot of work being happening in that simply the payment space. Just saying one of the most frustrating experiences in insurance as a customer is I'm covered. This is a completely legitimate claim. It's taken me two weeks to go through the entire process. All the pictures taken, the insurance assessor comes home and all of that stuff is done. The claim is approved, but I got to wait 10 days to get paid. Why is this instant, right? That's a huge customer service satisfaction issue. So a lot of effort and money going into those sort of phases that we never really think about in the insurance space. Please feel free to stop me or, you know, any questions you might have. Um, I'm going to be fairly quick because then we've got a hard stop at one o'clock. So what are some of the new insure techs doing? Here are some of the representative names over the last two years, two or three years that are doing interesting stuff across insurance sectors. And, you know, she talked about Verisk. In fact, I think we even have Verisk somewhere out there. But broadly, if you look at the insurance venture space, uh, which is essentially uh, mechanisms, like I said, to acquire customers across auto, small business, home, and life. Many of those names on that you may have um, actually experienced with. Anybody who's done any kind of work as a customer, or we've been a customer of any of those sort of companies on there? You have which one? Uh, Lemonade. Lemonade, yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, you know, next time you see a logo, one of these companies, try them out. Like, like she did, you know, for his car insurance. Um, I know Vikas was telling us yesterday, Vikas, you, you bought a car through, was it? Room. Room, right? Yeah, that's a car dealership, obviously, insurance, but they actually was online, digital, completely digital experience in terms of buying a car. And 
just high quality experience from front to back. Yeah. So I, I was just an online? Yes. It's called Broom? Broom. It's B R O O M. Thank you. I just tried uh, for life insurance. I, you know, I have it my policy through a large carrier, but um, as somebody who's covering this space, I was aware of what health, I, health IQ was doing. So health IQ is a life insurance space. Again, it's a you know four or five year old um, insure tech company funded by venture capital money. So I tried them out, right? And I cannot tell you how easy the process was. It's a matter of two or three days for them to give me a quote. It was a soft quote because it depends upon obviously somebody come out to your home, actually do a health check and do a blood sample and all of that. And in the state of Massachusetts, you've got to wait 30 days before an insurance policy is in effect. But it was a three-day process, very quick, a conversation on the phone, a couple of forms I had to fill out to give me a soft quote of the health, you know, health insurance stuff. Now, I'll, I will share this with you, actually. The health quote that I got from Health IQ was actually within 5 to 7% of what my large, old-style carrier offered. So it's not like they offered me a tremendously better price. Kind of like Shri, I mean, it was 5% better or 10% better than my major carrier. So apparently my health was not as good as I was hoping it was. But Health IQ is an interesting model because essentially using data, they're trying to go after, as they say, it's kind of the healthiest pool of, uh, of consumers and offer uh, hopefully a more efficient, convenient, and obviously much lower priced premiums for high class customers in terms of lower, so you know, people with the best health basically. Right? that are going to the gym, who are exercising, they've got the top 10% in terms of um, you know, health records, all of that stuff, health IQ is trying to go after. But beyond health, this, on the insurance software side, which is what I was telling you, the, the bread and butter, the back office kind of system stuff, there are a lot of established players in that space, like GuideBot and Duck Creek, which are not kind of in short tech. They are calling themselves in short tech. So these are firms that have been around and sold software for 15, 20 years. But many of them are either acquiring these startup companies or themselves actually very uh, aggressively digitizing and you know, creating these uh, digitized mechanisms and copying some of the health IQ model. And then you've got on the data analytics side, that's Verisk, LexisNexis, people like that. You might sort of be familiar with them from 25 years ago in the online search space. They are very aggressively look, going after the insurance space as well. And then we've got some new players like you know, Cape Analytics, uh, Carpet Data, and Viva Metrica that are providing various kinds of alternative data analytics for the insurance space. Telematics, as, as Sri was talking about, huge growth there. I've seen a lot of money that's flowing into the telematics space. The other thing I wanted to mention was this is more of, um, well, you've got some international names in here as well. Insurance is a space where this is actually a massive um, movement of money in global insurance, right? So it's not just in the US space. It's happening in Asia and Europe uh, as well. Europe and Asia seems to have slowed down a little bit this in terms of funding, but this is obviously a mammoth market globally, and much of the growth area is actually in the emerging <coughs> markets. Think about, you know, India and China collectively, for example, with almost 85% of the people there not having adequate health insurance. 90% of them are not having life insurance. So, you know, all of us have got an auto policy, right? So for insurance carriers, if they look at global growth, if you're a global player, it's not going to come from selling us more health insurance. Um, so some key insights, it's just kind of a, you know, eye chart here, so I wouldn't go, through, I don't expect you to read all that stuff, but just, you know, top of mind, now that we sort of understand what the structure of the industry is, relative premiums that are taking place. Now more from sort of from a banking standpoint, looking at again, where money is going to firms that are raising capital, do interesting things in insurance. And where some of the M&A activity is, that's kind of captured on this, on this slide. So this is more of a funding, investor-oriented, entrepreneur-oriented uh, you know, insights. So I'll sort of go through a couple of them. So like I said, insurance is still on a multi-year growth phase when it comes to capital, or venture capital, private equity money that's funding new startups. And uh, looking at the first half of this year, uh, the first half spending was about... Um, uh, $2.5 billion. If you annualize that, then at $5 billion for this year, it's going to be a new record for funding for insurance companies. Uh, number two is, um, one of the metrics to use when you look at small companies is not just the amount of funding going in, but how much are these firms raising in terms of what's the raw size of the amount that they're raising in terms of uh, funding and what the valuations are. 
And the insurance space, both in terms of the median uh, equity capital that's being raised and the median valuations are you know, trending up. Not any more than other sectors necessarily, but on a nice you know, upward path. Um, rated to me, you know, valuations, the pre-money valuations, don't worry about the pre and post money, sort of that's technical terms in, in you know, VC language, but the valuations overall vary widely by subsector. And I think I've got a slide that talks about that, uh, demonstrating big differences in what in investor appetite. So this is kind of where think about insurance broadly and then say, okay, we looked at personal lines, commercial lines, auto and home, and teasing out and saying, what are in investors interested in most in terms of investing in? And you can see on, on number three, the two sub bullet points that says that, you know, personal lines, uh, which is basically auto and home, so consumer oriented insurance startups, a valued uh, median valuation is 55 million. Don't worry about the number, but look at the relative size that it's much larger than health, which is at 37 million and the commercial multi-line and life uh, are, are, are much, much lower. So basically investors that are putting a valuation on an insure tech company across those sectors, that's the relative valuation they're putting on those, on those sectors. Um, Number four is just simply saying, again, related to that, that the consumer-oriented insure tax have done much better till now, attracted more funding. And you can see that, in fact, across financial services, that a lot more money is going to a consumer-oriented you know, startups versus enterprise-oriented, even though we're seeing that shift a little bit. And then on the M&A side, uh, a lot of the acquisitions that we've, we've seen have been Strategic investors, strategic investors basically meaning that it's not a financial investor, it's not a private equity company buying, buying somebody, it's an insurance carrier, right? So a lot more insurance carriers are buying these insure tech startups. So last week, uh, there was a major deal, Prudential Insurance bought a company called Assurance for three and a half billion dollars, I think I was telling uh, you guys yesterday. So massive uh, three and a half billion dollars that they wrote a check for, for a company that began in uh, 2016. So insurance carriers compared to other parts of financial services where incumbent institutions are saying, for example, you know, Fidelity down the road, I'm just taking this example, or Schwab or TD Ameritrade in the brokerage space is saying, okay, I've watched all what the robo-advisors are doing. We three years ago made some minority investments in some of the robo-advisors. But we are Fidelity brokerage, you've got the resources to actually see what the best startups are doing. And we can actually build and develop it ourselves. So Fidelity has their own electronic brokerage or online brokerage, a robo-advisor platform for Fidelity Go. Some of you might be clients of that there. There's, and so is Schwab, so, so is Vanguard. So a lot of the incumbents in rest of finance are actually copycatting the best that they've seen in terms of best practices in the startups. Not so much in insurance. Insurance, people are trying to do that, but a lot more insurance carriers are outright writing a check and buying an insurance tech. So in terms of just very quickly, I'll take five minutes more, Shri. Uh, this is at a global level where the spending is. You can see again the numbers. There's a lot of numbers here. To, I'll sort of guide you through that. All you need to look at is the growth rates of the last five to six years in terms of funding going in insurance companies. Right? And you can see a pretty good growth rate, well, 60% pretty you know, aggressive growth rate. And that's the number this year. In most other financial services sectors, that number actually is much lower than it was in 2018. But in insurance, you're still seeing a lot of money coming in there. Uh, if you look at where the funding has gone, uh, these are the top 20 insure tech companies and how much capital that they've raised. These are all private companies, by the way. And two quick observations that the two of the top 20 companies are actually Chinese companies, right? So like I was saying, huge growth opportunity in, in emerging markets. We've got you know, two in China, one in India, Policy Bazaar, which actually just this year uh, raised another round and became, um, became a, a unicorn. These are numbers as of last year. So this is capital raised in the top 20 firms. Still obviously about seven in 10 companies or 17 out of 20 or 16 out of 20 are, are, are US based firms, but uh, a huge amount of capital being raised uh, in insurance. Uh, just two minutes on this, and this is, I think this is, this is important. If you kind of break up insurance, like we've already now got a context of insurance in the different sectors. So what this is showing you basically is for the last year and a half, it's, it's showing you the median valuation, which means uh, if you've got 100 companies that raise capital in a particular insurance sector, for example, in life and annuity, 
What's the median company? How much capital have they, what the median valuation is? On the y-axis, the median capital raised. And the size of the bubble is the total amount of capital raised in the last year and a half by private companies in those sectors. So right off the bat, you can see health seems to be a space which has you know, attracted the most amount of capital, followed by you know, personal lines, property and casualty, which is auto and home. Then you've got life annuity and commercial lines uh, you know, elsewhere. Now, why that is happening is, is pretty complicated and the picture is not entirely com complete. We're still in kind of phase one of a you know, 10 year transformation of the insurance space. Uh, but some of the areas are on the PNC side, personal lines, like I talked about, that was where a lot of it was, it was much easier to acquire customers for insurance in the consumer market than the insurance space. So a lot more of these online models basically came out right off the bat and said, we're going to acquire customers in the retail space, much harder to do on the, on the, on the enterprise side. So a lot more capital went into all those online acquisition and distribution tools like Lemonade that were focused on the consumer. Uh, on the M&A side, just very quickly, and I'll sort of hand it back over to Sri. Um, so this is basically acquisitions of insure tech companies by um, all kinds of players. And like I said, uh, a large number of acquirers have been insurance carriers, but also a fairly healthy group of private equity, private equity companies, in some cases, actually, even uh, telco companies and big tech companies that have been acquiring insurance, uh, insurance firms. So in terms of M&A, you can see you know, pretty healthy uh, growth rate, both in terms of deals and the number of, number of capital raised. And again, uh, the takeaway from that you need to take is that carriers are being very aggressive in terms of acquiring insure techs compared to other sectors where incumbents are actually saying, no, if I'm a you know, large bank doing payments, I can actually copy certain aspects of what Stripe and Square might be doing. I don't need to actually you know, use many of those products or acquire those. So that's kind of a very quick whirlwind what's happening in insurance. Um, I'll be around to take questions after, but I know we've got a hard stop at one. So thank you for your time and I'll hand it back to Sri. Thanks everybody for the phone. Uh, that's an excellent overview of um, InsurTech. Um, give me one second. I think some of the users are reporting that they're not able to see the, the content properly. Give me one second, let me just adjust that. Okay, so I just wanted to add one more note, actually two more notes regarding InsurTech before we move to machine learning. Um, this is a very data-driven industry, uh, especially insurance. And uh, you know, one of the challenges I've seen entrepreneurs face when they're kind of working with InsurTech products is uh, the reason why there's a lot of emphasis on B2C products is because, you know, especially entrepreneurs who are technology friendly and haven't really kind of understood the insurance industry well. They predominantly see it as you know, products like other financial products offered to customers and focus on the mobile experience, focus on the interface, focus on the features. Uh, but the insurance industry works differently compared to other traditional industries. You know, the whole risk aspect of how do you pool similar risk profiles and then think about the, you know when does the payout actually happen? Right, you are paying your premiums, and there's a uh, event which happens, and because of that event, now the payout should happen. And now the insurance industry is basically building out all these models to think about like how do you pool all these you know similar uh, you know accounts together, and then it's a very co capitalized industry. and which means that you know in terms of uh, raising money, in terms of Know, spending on innovation, you know, they're having you know, significant challenge and there's a lot of innovations happening in the B2B space too, especially in the context of uh, insurance link securities. And uh, they think about like financial engineering ways in which you can create different kinds of products, you know, life insurance securitized products and other kinds of insurance uh, <laughs> uh, securities. Um, so uh, 
innovation in the insurance tech space need not always happen you know, outside of the insurance industry, even within the insurance companies, there's a lot of innovation happening and they're leveraging technology and big data and machine learning to kind of, kind of have these innovations in place so that they can think about new products which could be used from a financial engineering perspective to help with their capital flows within the company, not just from a product perspective. <clears throat> okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is get an orientation on AI and machine learning in finance. And this is a hot topic. Everybody wants to do AI and machine learning nowadays. How many of you have done any AI or machine learning? Couple of you. How many of you are familiar with Python? Not this thing. Uh, the language, programming language. Uh, how many of you are comfortable with uh, MATLAB, R, SAS? And a couple of you. So this introduction is gonna be a very high level introduction. I'm not gonna talk about Python packages. I'm not gonna talk about writing code and writing functions and things like that. So we have a bootcamp for that too. Uh, we'll talk about those specifics when you get there. Uh, my goal for you is, is to get excited about you know, uh, how AI and machine learning is kind of you know, impacting finance in the first place. So this was a presentation I gave at the CFA annual conference, which happened in London a few months ago, and I've taken uh, parts of it and I've uh, made it available. Um, so as you can see, there's a whole revolution going on in terms of technology. You know, they talk about fourth industrial revolution, wherein uh, in the first industrial revolution, you had water out power and steam, and that basically created a tectonic shift in which uh, you know, industries, new kinds of industries kind of came into play. And then you had like the mass production, you know, the Fords of the world, uh, the GMs of the world kind of came in and that changed the way auto manufacturing was done. And then in the third, uh, you know, uh, industrial revolution, you had computers, automation kick in. And, you know, as most of you know, some of the things 20 years ago, which had to be done in a manual fashion, are now mostly outdated. And now we are kind of you know, talking about the fourth industrial revolution where there's a lot of, uh, you know, AI and robotics and different kinds of teams coming to play, uh, wherein it's going to create a lot of new innovations which we haven't even seen yet. Um, there's a lot of um, new innovations, and I'm going to skip through some of these and share the slides, uh, and you can go through those links and see some of these articles. Some of the fascinating innovations uh, which are happening. The reason why I'm mentioning these is um, the technology industry has been very uh, much focused on bringing these data-driven technologies into fruition. You know, the Apples of the world, the you know, Amazons, the Google, Microsoft, IBM, all these companies have invested significantly in enhancing the frameworks and the infrastructure and the compute to make it feasible to use these kinds of technologies in a very easy way. You don't have to invest in clusters. You can just log in on a cloud and you can basically start a cluster and you can do intensive analysis and spend maybe a couple of dollars, you know, cost of a cup of coffee to get you a Monte Carlo simulation, which probably required at least hundreds of thousands of dollars to put in the infrastructure to do it when you had it three years ago. And the way you evaluate innovation in the industry is to predominantly look at the patent files. You know, because when you look at technical publications, you know, I have uh, you know, two feet, well, one in academia and one in industry and kind of track what's happening in both areas. So on the academic side of things, you look at the conferences and the kinds of publications which are coming to these conferences. And then you look at the increase in number of publications in machine learning and AI and all these areas, you see like, you know, you know it's right for innovation. You know, all these researchers are kind of, kind of building out these things. But the industry adoption is tracked by the number of patent filings the industry is actually doing. And the, uh, the WIPO, uh, they basically uh, did a report and a couple of key themes there was, you can see this curve in terms of the scientific publications in artificial intelligence. And this curve tracks the patent filings. You can see that between 2012 and 2017, there's an exponential growth in terms of publications and patent filings in the context of AI. Kind of break it down into various areas. This is neural networks. You know, people familiar with neural networks know what they are. You know, deep learning and neural networks has been extremely hard the last five to seven years in machine learning and AI. Um, so neural networks, you can see that 
it was more or less flat till like the early 90s. And I'll talk about like why that was the case. And you see a significant increase in uh, number of publications. And also in the last few years, you see this hockey stick effect of the number of patents being filed in the biomedical you know, networks. Yes, please. How are you able to get patents on machine learning algorithms when they're predominantly written in open uh, It's an offline discussion. We talk about it, we can talk about it. Some of them are not just the algorithms, but actual products, which leverage those in the methodology and how you actually go about doing it. And uh, you can see, you know, Google patents and Amazon patents, they kind of, you know, say, here's a box which does this and uses this. And the mechanism of how it's actually done may be an algorithm. But the, the, the way it gets packaged into a product, how, how you and I use, would be the way the innovation that we try. Um, and then here's uh, support vector machines, which is another uh, algorithm, rule based learning, deep learning. So these are all major themes which are predominantly talked about in the context of uh, AI and machine learning innovation. So typically, what happens is the Silicon Valley you know, adopts these innovations, the startups, and they create all these products. So that's why you can get like $150 you know, robot, uh, robotic vacuum cleaner plus. And then you can see all these other things kind of you know, coming to other areas. Health usually comes later. Finance picks it up after a few years. And you can see a lot of financial services industries kind of, you know, starting to adopt AI and machine learning products. And uh, all these large companies are significantly increasing their workforce in the context of AI and machine learning. Uh, I would say more than 60 to 70 percent of what we do at Quad University is predominantly AI yeah, machine learning and data science related work. So, um, just to just to set the, the context of why this is something every company has to think about. Uh, so this is a, a tweet. Uh, anybody following uh, Elon Musk on Twitter? Okay, a couple of you. So. Uh, this was Elon Musk, 7th August, 2018, more, more or less like a year ago, um, 9.48 a.m. He's sitting in California somewhere, he sends out a tweet saying, you know, I'm take, considering taking Tesla private at 420, funding secure, and shareholders today will sell at 420 or hold or go private. So this is something he sends out 9.48 a.m. in California. In the East Coast, and Bloomberg actually put out this, uh, message afterwards on LinkedIn. Um, so they basically have a direct connection to Twitter. And within a couple of, uh, within less than a second, it was already on the Bloomberg terminal. This particular tweet here he sent. So within half a second, it's already on the terminal. He sent send, and then it's already available in New York and other places, right? But guess what? The price impact has already happened within the first few years. He's sending out. That particular tweet. So the absorption of that information into the market is happening at such a rapid pace that it's impossible for humans to go in and see, look at it, analyze it, and then make those decisions in a, at a human level. So you have these algorithms kicking in with new pieces of information, they're processing it, they're making these kinds of trades. Right? So just to kind of set the context, uh, you know, that why it's extremely important to consider AI and machine learning in the context of finance and fintech. So if you were trained like me as a font, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, anybody fonts in the room? Any fonts in the room? You're a font? Okay. So you would probably be familiar with, you know, if you did a master's in finance in, or master's in quantitative finance or uh, computational mathematics or any of these things. These are typically the kinds of things you would typically study, you know, factor models, optimization, uh, derivative pricing, trading strategies, simulations, et cetera, et cetera. But nowadays, when you talk about uh, machine learning and AI, a lot of skills being sought are on this side of the spectrum. You know, things like natural language processing, robotic process automation, computer vision, graph analytics, building chatbots, sentiment analysis using alternative data, predictive analytics, real-time analytics. So all these are typically concepts which came in from the statistical uh, computer science uh, and uh, mathematics kinds of communities, operations research also. Uh, most of these are the kinds of skills which a lot of companies are seeking. So if you go to any of the job boards, you'll probably talk about you know, machine learning, data science, AI, uh, but also some of these themes would be very uh, prominent 
uh, common buildings if you're looking for uh, data science related positions. Now, why is that so? <clears throat> well, uh, just to kind of, you know, even, even some of the certification programs like CFA, you know, they have some reading going on, and, you know, what FinTech is and what machine learning and AI is. So there are three things which uh, has happened in the last five to, uh, you know, uh, 10, 10 to 15 years or so. Uh, first, you have a lot more data. And when you talk about data, it's not just, uh, you know, storage of data. You have a lot of data you're collecting. You have a lot of clusters which are just basically working to source information and then save it into databases. Um, so you have, you know, in the past, maybe a system with a couple of gigabytes was sufficient, but you have terabytes of data, you know, uh, more data that which uh, is being just collected and stored. On the other hand, the frequency of collection of information has also significantly increased in these colors, the velocity. So the updates you would typically get, for example, in the stock market, you, know, you are seeing a lot more granularity in information than the amount of information you're getting in, the, in, the, in those aspects. On the other hand, you're seeing a variety of information being collected. So in the past, typically you would store data in traditional relational database schemes, which look like predominantly like an Excel sheet, if you will, rows and columns. But nowadays you're getting a lot of information. You're collecting telematics related data, social media tweets, image related data, video related data. You're collecting a lot more information to make those decisions. And then you also have the problem of, you know, the uncertainty of data. How much of the data is actually accurate and how much of it should be processed in such a way that you, know, you can, you can uh, you know, uh, that's not the veracity of the data. So that's the data part. And uh, the second driver is the algorithms. And you're seeing a lot of smart algorithms which are out there. And uh, when I talk about just algorithms, it's the algorithmic frameworks, if you will. Uh, so on the one hand, you have um, some of these frameworks which support distribution of your calculations. You know, 10 years ago, when uh, I was helping out companies build out simulation engines, they would say, well, I can go up to 10,000 simulations, and there was no scientific basis on why 10,000 uh, simulations. It was just that I had a machine, it could run at a particular pace, they did not have a budget for a new machine, and they wanted results by nine o'clock. So with all those constraints, they could only run 10,000 simulations. And uh, you, know, you would get some result, but that, that was what, and today with the cloud, you could basically distribute your calculations and you have frameworks like Spark and Kafka and Hadoop and others, but you could basically set up your architecture and you can more or less scale infinitely and you can get your calculations going. On the other hand, uh, as I mentioned briefly, there's this whole notion of what is called as deep learning, which has significantly enhanced the way in which we process information. And what's happened is uh, you have a lot of uh, larger uh, research organizations kind of innovate in the context of deep learning, but also you have a lot of companies supporting you know, research and development in these areas. For example, there was a platform called TensorFlow, which is heavily supported by Google, and uh, Keras, the image of uh, Keras basically joined Google, so it's kind of integrated heavily in TensorFlow. Then you have MXNet, which is supported by Amazon, and Torch and PyTorch supported by Facebook. And you have seen DK and other Azure web products supported by uh, Microsoft. So you have all these large players basically putting in a lot of resources to support these frameworks to facilitate you know, uh, easy uh, development of uh, machine learning products. But in addition to that, most of these are open source products. So you have a whole community of you know, supporters and developers basically supporting these products, which basically means that you know, a graduate student who's working 40 hours at Verisk can take a class and then use tooling and create a, an awesome product in a few weeks without having to really get the whole picture of how these algorithms are built. Because all of them are like off, available off the shelf. So you could basically download it. You can fire up an instance on Amazon and just basically say, these are my images. And I've trained them to say that this is of this particular gable roof type, this other roof type, basically train it, and then keep enhancing the number of tests, then come up with an algorithm and a model which can, at a pretty decent rate, 
you know, tell out what types of group types are without even understanding the underlying aspects of how these algorithms work, which is making machine learning accessible to a larger segment of people who you know, may not have had access to those types of platforms in the past. And I mean, you know, I have a computer science background, so when I studied computer science and kind of understood those algorithms and frameworks in general real world, it was extremely hard to even construct programs. And you know, the, 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 the programming languages which were out there, you had to go through a whole process. You had to think about the compiler, you had to think about the driver, you had to think about the operating system, you had to think about every aspect of it, and then you had to go through a whole process of compiling and testing, and then it would be ready for even operation. But nowadays, with all these fourth generation languages which are out there, Python, everybody can do it. I mean, you download and you play and you do it, and you know, uh, you, it's very forgiving too. So you can try out a lot of things. Um, but that's kind of the state of where we are. In addition to that, there's been a lot of innovations in hardware, which basically means that you can actually compute at a very large scale without having to invest in the actual resources to test. In the past, you had to buy these clusters because you could not rent them. And that was an annual budget thing. You know, at the end, at the beginning of the year, when I used to be at Citigroup, you know, we had access to X number of servers and we could only get access to those servers based on the amount of time we had, and those was the, that was the amount of limitation we had when we had to do calculations. Today, we can go to the cloud, and you just need to give you a credit card, and they're gonna say, let's say, 20 cents per hour, and you basically say, okay, spawn up 10,000 instances and run 10,000 experiments, and it's easy. Anybody can do it. Anybody as in, like, anybody who's understanding the ecosystem has been trained, they can, they can do it. On the other hand, you know, you have a lot more players in the space, and all these players are basically competing with each other, bringing cost points down, adding the whole ecosystem of services, and you know, building the maturity in terms of you know, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. So you have this maturity of these products, which makes it easy for enterprises to come up. And that's the reason why financial services has been able to leverage all this power and bring it into uh, you know, uh, in the fruition in many financial engineering use cases. Uh, as you know, financial data is very messy, and you have a lot of variety of data, and you know, the information content in the data is very small, so you have to do a lot of testing and trying to figure out if there is something which could be used for, for decision making. And in order to do that, you know, it's not a physical problem where you could say, okay, I have figured out an equation and just pass this data and you can and do these results. So there's a lot of hypothesis you have to think about, you have to test it out, and then figure out whether there's value, try out alternate hypothesis. So that's all being feasible with the technology things which are up there. So um, how are we doing on time? So we have another 25 minutes. So I'm gonna give you uh, a quick introduction to what machine learning is about, just to give you a context on why we're doing what we're doing. This is a part of a, a series of classes we do. We actually have a whole certificate program as the analytics certificate program, wherein we have three modules and we basically talk about each one of these modules. One is like visualization of the data, exploration of the data, understanding the data, uh, the feature engineering parts, the taking the data and creating it into, you know, uh, setting the framework so that you can actually process and work with it and then building out a whole model, and then trying and testing the model and deploying the model. So it's a whole workflow built into it. Uh, it's actually a 13-week graduate course I teach at Northeastern. Uh, but for today, I'm just gonna give you like a 10-minute, 15-minute introduction of how it's typically done. Uh, by no means that this is the way, you know, if you say, oh, 15 minutes, now I can go to Goldman Sachs and apply this, uh, that won't be the case. But uh, just to give you a context on a uh, uh, brief, Introduction to what AI and machine learning is all about. Okay, so this is typically the workflow on how machine learning is done. Um, if anybody is interested in this uh, thing, we actually have posters. You can send me an email and we can send you more. Basically, the ecosystem has matured now uh, that it's not just one person doing super. You know, in the past, it would be just be, you know, they would say, I want a data scientist. They would say, what would a data scientist do? Collect the data, process the data, build the model, say, you know, do the hypothesis testing, and scale the model, and deploy the model. That would be the role of data scientists. But that has changed because every 
unit actually requires expertise in some way to optimally use this platform. So you have a whole ecosystem of products out there. Um, so typically you have this notion of data engineering and DevOps, wherein you have the whole notion of data scraping, data exploration, data cleansing, and feature engineering, where you take this data, which could be from one source or multiple sources, and you have to scrape data from one place to another. These are all very important things. For example, um, yesterday there was a ruling um, there's a startup which was scraping LinkedIn's data and it was processing it and uh, basically uh, LinkedIn sued them saying that you know, we are basically uh, taking our data and uh, the courts actually said no, this company, this startup can actually scrape the data. It's publicly available information on the site so you can actually get the data. So there are a lot of companies and startups collecting social data. And tomorrow when um, Darshak uh, is going to do the guest talk on uh, uh, fintech in India. You can see how emerging markets are actually leveraging social data as a proxy for formal credit scores. Because in the, many of the emerging markets, you don't have like, the FICO scores, you don't have the transaction history all collated in one place. But then you can basically say, okay, I trust the FICO score and I'll give it like you know 60% weightage, and I'm giving a loan to a particular person. And there are other areas where you, know, you could, you know, there are people who may not have a good quality credit score. So what is their social uh, uh, thing like? And then uh, tomorrow you're gonna hear from Darshak on some of the things they're doing, how they did in another company, where they're basically scraping data from social websites. Who are these people talking to? Who are there in their network? And basically using all that information to build a profile. And all these are typically done to kind of you know, build out these innovative products like that. And then there's a lot of uh, emphasis put on modeling because you have collected all this data and you can't just take this data and say, okay, I have this data and I can like now make decisions because you had to have a model which could either be some kind of a summarization model which will give you insights on various groups or it could be a model which is gonna be used for prediction wherein you could say, given a particular social profile, given a particular credit score, given income, given history, et cetera, et cetera, can I give this person a loan? What's the probability of default if I give this person a loan? And then the company could have a business criteria saying that, you know, if the chances of a person defaulting is greater than 20%, I'm gonna deny this person a loan. And my model is gonna tell me what's the probability of default based on the default records we have and all the data we have collected to date. <clears throat> so in the past, people were doing gut-based decisions, experience-based decisions, where you have, I'm gonna have a decision rule, where you know, if you uh, got a mortgage and you, you know, spoke to your mortgage uh, broker, they would basically say, okay, what's your debt-to-income ratio? How much do you currently owe? What's the uh, uh, what's your current obligations? How much do you earn, et cetera, et cetera. Go through the whole list and say, oh, by the way, you're gonna get this much interest rate based on all the information you provided. So the machine learning models are basically replacing those static, you know, rigid decision rules which people have been using. <coughs> now, these models are so ubiquitous that anybody can try out these models. Uh, Python and other packages have made it easy to basically try out different models. So there's a lot of expertise required in figuring out the right evaluation criteria. And that's where the data scientists experience and skills come in. They can look at the results from multiple models, not only evaluate based on accuracy or you know, how the models have performed, but also look at various other aspects, which could be soft in some ways. In some, for example, in some companies, they may say, you know what, I can only trust interpretable models. I want to see the factors. I want to be able to figure out like what's the influence of a FICO score on the predicted interest rate. I should be able to explain things in case something goes back. And those are predominantly business rules which people talk about and that would be factored in by the data scientists to figure out what kinds of models could potentially be used for the use cases. And then there's a lot of talk about, well, you know, we as humans want to make our lives easier and easier and easier, right? Like that's the whole goal. Like you know, we lead our lives, figuring out like, you know, I don't want to clean, I want a robotic, you know, vacuum cleaner. 
I don't want to wash dishes. I want a dishwasher. I don't want to wash clothes. I want a washing machine. So we made our life simpler in every case. And machine learning scientists and data scientists are kind of in the same pursuit. So we don't want to clean all this data. How do we have products which can automatically clean the data? That's all ripe for innovation where a lot of new products are coming in. We don't want to, you know, think about feature engineering. Typically, what used to happen was statisticians and data scientists in the past, uh, even though they weren't called data scientists, they were statisticians and mathematicians, they would go in and look at all the features, look at feature importance, figure out which features were, uh, which combination of features were actually useful for modeling. So they were going and doing a lot of training and testing and validation, things like that. So now you're basically saying, well, why should we have humans do those pick and choose? You know, what, why can't we just put it on the cloud, try all combinations, and just sort it and pick the best? So we are trying to make the search problem of this optimal space much easier. And we are trying to figure out ways in which we can avoid that human uh, decision making come into play when we try to pick and choose different algorithms different parameters for these algorithms. And that's the whole notion of what is called as automatic machine learning, right? Um, this company in the area called Data Robot. Anybody heard of Data Robot? That's the only thing they do. I mean, behind the scenes, basically have this infrastructure and they're saying, well, you have so many combinations of parameters and to hire a data scientist, it's gonna cost you a six figure for sure, but probably 200K to get a decent data scientist who has a PhD from you know, MIT and who has good data experience and they come in and say, where's the data? Where's the data? I'm gonna go and figure out the best particular algorithm. They say, well, why don't we need such expertise when you could budget a software package and then leverage cloud and compute to basically try out different combinations and get a good enough model, which is better than what we have now, which is not. So a lot of products come, are coming in to basically make some of these algorithm selection and algorithm choices easier. Data Robot uh, is one of those companies. There's another company called H2O, uh, which uh, is a California-based company, and they are also very much involved with AutoML. Um, they got funded by Goldman Sachs. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, funded them $70 million a week ago or so, uh, because they're kind of seeing that uh, uh, this would be of the future. I'm involved with an organization called COSI based out of India in France, and uh, Europe is doing a lot of work in terms of automatic machine learning, and there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of work happening in this particular space. And finance is actually picking it up uh, quite a bit. Um, I was speaking at a, a model governance and uh, model validation conference uh, in New York a couple of months ago, and the head of model risk at uh, Bank of America was saying that you know they are basically using some of these products to do the benchmarking for data scientists. So the data scientists actually come up with a bunch of models and they're basically using these platforms to say, well, the models are saying that this is something which is feasible. How come you're saying that this is the level of accuracy you're reaching? Or if the humans are saying that, you know, they're able to come up with a particular level, is it kind of jiving if you use automatic machine learning? So they're kind of you know, mixing and matching some of these methodologies and coming up with new processes to build out different types of models. And then there's this whole notion of model inference because all the things we're talking about is coming up with a model which says that given certain inputs, I'm going to be able to give out certain outputs. Now the question is, if I wanted to do it to scale, then obviously data scientists are not not software engineers, they're not hardware engineers. Uh, most of the data scientists think about data analysis and they are framing these problems, they're structuring these problems. And now comes in, how do you make this scalable so that you can make hundreds of thousands of decisions potentially, right? So if you are trying to build out algos, which are doing trading, which are leveraging large amounts of information and they are constantly monitoring things uh, out there, constantly changing the parameters of these models, you require a lot of hardware, a lot of infrastructure to be able to scale. And that's where you know, a lot of software engineering effort is being put in. The whole notion of AI ops and ML ops is coming into play. And they're basically trying to make sure the whole area to do software, <coughs> to do inference uh, in terms of models. That's kind of the ecosystem, if you will, 
uh, kind of under the hood of what's actually happening in the context of machine learning. Uh, there are a lot of startups working in most of these areas. Um, whenever you see um, you know, uh, a particular area which is inefficient, uh, you know, software engineers, and uh, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, uh, students who are working on their PhDs focus on a particular theme, and if they find that there's value in it, they spin it off as a startup, and that gets you know, funding, and then usually that company gets acquired by a larger company because they think about an ecosystem of uh, products which can facilitate uh, that particular work for the future. And uh, this is becoming something which every company wants to automate and wants to facilitate without you having to do things from scratch. Uh, in the past, people would say, well, if I learn Python and learn how to do all these aspects, I can get a job. And it's like, you know, you learning HTML in the late 90s, thinking of becoming like a web developer. And it was good for the first few years. And after that, you know, there were frameworks, there are products out there in the enterprise. If you just say, I know HTML, it's like no longer sufficient. You, know, you had to have more enterprise skills to build our products. And that's where machine learning and AI is going. A lot of the things which people were thinking, oh, I can pick up Python and take a class and get, get it going. It's kind of, you know, Microsoft and Amazon and all these other players are having products nowadays where the point and click can actually have API endpoints. You can easily pick up solutions. Uh, so expect a shift again in terms of what you need to know when you're trying to build out these products as well. Okay, so that's um, kind of the big picture of uh, what machine learning is. So what I'll do is, uh, in the interest of time, skip some of the details, but I've shared all the slides with you. So just follow through the slides, it kind of is self-explanatory. So what you do is you start with data, you figure out what kind of data you have, whether it's cross-sectional or longitudinal, depending on how your data is. And then uh, you define your goals on what you want to do. We want to do statistics, or you want to do machine learning or predictive analytics, and then figure out like what kind of problem am I having? I'll stop here for a second, because one of the problems we are trying to address is what's called the prediction problem. And uh, I'll, when I show you the demo, basically what we are trying to do is, if I have a tweet, or if I have any statement, can I say whether the statement is positive or negative, right? It's basically what's called as a natural language processing sentiment analysis problem. And in order to do that, we are trying to you know, structure it as what's called as a prediction problem. Given enough statements, which are labeled positive or negative, can I train an algorithm to predict, given a new statement, whether the statement is positive or negative? So that's kind of the structure of the problem. And it's basically what's called a supervised learning problem in the machine learning sense. And there are also other problems like clustering. You know, typically if you're trying to make cluster stocks, you know, you, uh, you use clustering. A lot of um, robot advisors are nowadays using a lot of machine learning, uh, especially with all the ETFs which are out there, trying to personalize things for you. People who have this kind of a portfolio may also like these other products because you are maybe very interested in international markets or you're interested in the particular domain. So they're kind of using machine learning to come up with some of those recommendations too. <clears throat> okay, um, so in terms of machine learning algorithms, I think for today, it may be too much to go through all of these. Just to give you an idea, these are kind of the keywords you will look at, like, you know, unsupervised, supervised, reinforcement learning, so I say semi-supervised learning. Uh, and typically, the model would have what are called as a bunch of different features. And you'll have a label. And you would say something like, you know, if I have specific kinds of words, like angry, uh, you know, uh, yelled, et cetera, et cetera, then it may be, you know, the sentiment is bad. Or maybe happy, excellent, maybe you know, these kinds of words maybe the sentiment is good. So that's kind of a crude way of defining the problem, if you will. But typically, natural language processing use multiple methodologies to create the required features. In the computer science context, we talk what's called as embeddings. And they create the required word embeddings so that you can actually map it to the outcome. And uh, you build out the models to train for those uh, factors, which, is going to, which are going to be used for those prediction challenges. OK. So um, let me kind of get to uh, the demo part. Basically, what we are doing in here 
is we are collecting the data. We need to cleanse it. We need to extract the required features, build out a model, and we do this process of training and testing. Basically what it means is if I have a bunch of data, I can't predict the future. So I'm gonna take a portion of the data and build a model and use it for this other data which I haven't used at all and figure out whether the model actually works for the data I've kept aside. And if it works pretty well, then say I have a pretty decent model. If it does not work, then obviously the model is bad. Right? So typically you use this process of training and testing where you spend a lot of time figuring out how do you optimize or tune your model. And once you have built a pretty decent model, you you know you select which models to use and you deploy it and you use it. So um, what we will do is we will set up a problem. Uh, the example I have uh, wanted to show demo was, you know, in terms of uh, natural language processing, there are a lot of interesting problems you can define. And uh, the easiest way to test out natural language processing is talking to your Alexa, or Siri, or Google Now, or Cortana, or any of these chatbots you have. All of them are using machine learning. And whenever you interact with one of these devices, basically structures this as one of these problems. It could be a question and answer problem. Right? You could say, what's the weather in Boston today? And it will interpret that as a question, and it will go back and figure out where the answer is and come back to those questions. It could be a summarization. Uh, could you summarize the forecast for the weather? It may summarize based on information, frame a bunch of sentences. It could give you sentiments. You know, it, could do, uh, it could basically have a statement, and you could say that the statement is happy or sad. Um, the machine translation, how do you say uh, goodbye in French and it's a machine learning, so it will basically say goodbye, pass it to a translator, back to response. So all these are different kinds of uh, problems which, uh, in which machine learning in, is actually used. Um, so a lot of financial institutions are creating products uh, which are customized for financial use cases. And uh, you, know, uh, you, can, you can find a bunch of these uh, you know, uh, in the press. Uh, we'll focus on one, what is called a sentiment analysis. And uh, basically what it means is, given a statement, you want to understand whether the statement is positive or negative. And one of the practical use cases is, you know, uh, there's the system called Edgar, the SEC database of Edgar, where you have annual reports. There are a lot of startups which are now basically taking publicly available data, adding value by using machine learning to either extract information and creating automated data sets which are easy to use by other financial entities, are basically doing some kind of sentiment analysis or extracting factors out of it and making those factors available. So a lot of companies, if you search around, uh, they're basically playing in the space. So what we did was wanted to show a prototype of how you can actually build one of these as a part of our uh, you know, uh, online classes. So one of them is basically looking at a statement and when you have owning call statements, you have the whole report, if you will. Now, overall, how much of these statements in the annual meeting were positive? And how many were negative? It'll give you a pretty decent understanding on like, you know, how well the call went, the earnings call went. Right? So let's say you have a portfolio of 50 stocks you're tracking. You have an interest list for 50 stocks. And uh, you are, you know, every quarter, you have these 50 earning calls and you can't go to every one of these calls, and listen to them and make your own decisions. So typically what people do is wait for their favorite analyst to write a summary and send out a note. A couple of days later, you see it in your inbox, you look at it and say, oh, okay, Boeing, this is the analysis. This was there because you have these analysts sitting in these calls, they are bombarding the, uh, the uh, investor relations folks with questions and, and they get the answers and then, you basically interpret that, and then you come up with your summary. Right? Uh, so a lot of companies are now thinking about like you know using machine learning and AI to kind of you know summarize those. That way, you can give you like a dashboard based on your personalized list on these earning calls. Like how do you rank them in terms of uh, sentiments, uh, and then you can kind of focus on this. You know, it's a decision support tool. So uh, there are a bunch of challenges in kind of building these things out. And one of the challenges is the availability of quality data to build out these models. If you look at scientific publications, most of the uh, papers have used what is called as the IMDB dataset. 
which is basically movie dialogues, which is easy to transcribe. So you have hundreds of thousands of movies out there, they're transcribed all these, and they're basically created a sentiment database where you have this and you can you know, use that to train your models. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, most of the movies I've at least gone to are very sentimental. People usually don't talk in that way in real life. Right, you know, our lives are really mundane compared to what Hollywood portrays what life is about, right? Um, so uh, in addition to that, the domain specific aspects of it, you know, how doctors talk to each other, how financial analysts talk to each other, um, and the way they convey sentiments about a particular asset, right? It's not easily, it's not very emotional. You know, an analyst is not, you know, putting a lot of emotion when they're talking about, you know, the next future, not being able to take the numbers. Kind of thing. Um, so it's very hard to interpret financial data. So even if you can read and interpret the information and in, you know earnings calls, it's hard to kind of extract the emotion. So to kind of you know build a sentiment score, it's extremely difficult in the context of finance. We just wanted to illustrate that aspect uh, through a case study. And one of the things we wanted to do was well, rather than we build out the models, we have a bunch of uh, machine learning APIs which are out there. And if you go to Amazon or Google or Microsoft or um, any of these uh, providers, they actually provide APIs where you can give them a statement and they'll tell you whether it's positive or negative. And you pay a small fee. And you know, usually 10,000 calls you make, API calls, and they'll give you a particular rate. You know, for 10,000 calls, it's gonna cost you $20 or whatever it is. So typically, uh, the value these companies provide is you don't have to build the model yourselves. We have a lot of data. By no means you can even collect that amount of data. If you're trying to compete with Google now to say that I'm gonna collect the data like what Google does, build a sentiment analysis like what Google does and then create a service, it's a little too late, right? So all these companies already have a lot more data than us. So they basically have APIs and they say, well, we'll use the best of three technologies to create these machine learning models. And you just need to call us and we will tell you and we'll give you a score for these APIs. So that's kind of the thing. And we just wanted to evaluate how it's gonna look. And we build a platform called this QSandbox. When we do day four, I'll give you access to the platform so you can actually use the QSandbox to try out this and uh, some other experiments too, including the credit risk model, which we're gonna build from scratch on the last day. Uh, but I wanna give you uh, you know, a quick uh, um, view of how it's going to look. Um, you know, when I do the results. So, I'll show you the final report of um, one of the analysis we did. Um, so what you're seeing in here is basically we took uh, the Edgar Form 425, which is publicly available. We built a scraper, we went online, got this report, uh, and then we basically said, well, we'll chop it slice by size. Uh, these are all the Python packages for people kind of you know, understanding, wanting to understand the code level. Uh, we scraped it, we converted them into sentences, and then we said, we're gonna pass these sentences to all these four APIs and let them come back with scores and we'll evaluate those scores. Um, so when we did that, so this is like the Amazon. So typically when you send a sentence, um, for example, if I send something like, you know, I ordered a small and expected, so this is like a, a review, right? You know, uh, fit, but it was a little bit more like medium large. It was great quality. It was light brown and pictured. It would be 10 times better if it was lined with cotton or wool on the inside. Um, so this was what, if you send it to uh, Amazon's corporate API, they'll come back with sentiment saying this is mixed. It was mostly mixed in terms of sentiments. Very low probability, it adds up to 100. It gives you probability numbers. 89% mixed, 9% positive, 1% negative, 0% neutral. So this is how it's gonna give you back the response. Uh, this is uh, Azure. So if uh, you know, you look at Azure, they give you a different scale. They say, you know, uh, 
more than 0.5 is positive, less than 0.5 is negative. Otherwise, it's neutral, and this is how it's going to give you a distribution. And uh, this is the Google. So if you pass in data to Google, it's going to give you a different score anywhere from the score is greater than 0.1, then it's positive, less than minus 0.1, it's negative, minus 0.1 to 0.1, and then if the magnitude is greater than 1.4, then it's mixed. So this is how their scale is. So everybody is having their own scale of you know, defining the sentiments. So we wanted to kind of you know, try out with the Edgar data. So this is all example data, how it's going to look. Um, so instead of we building our own sentiment analysis model, we basically took one report and then we chopped all the data and we sent it. And this is kind of the summary. One of the interesting things to notice, um, you know, this is Comprehend, which is uh, Amazon's API. So for the same data, Comprehend said it was positive, but um, for the same data, 70% of the data was positive as per Watson, and only close to 18 to 20% of the data was positive as per Amazon. Amazon mostly said that, they, that the report was neutral. So if I trusted Amazon and I sent this report to Amazon, based on all the analysis, it would say it was mostly neutral. But if I gave the same report to Watson, IBM Watson, it will come back saying it was mostly positive. Right? So each one of these vendors taking the same data is giving different scores, so you get different interpretations. And the summary I tell my students is it's ripe for innovation. It's not a solved problem yet. In humans, more or less, you give the same information, you can interpret it and say, well, it's mostly positive, mostly negative. You may have different views, but if you give a piece of information, you will interpret that sort of information and say that it's positive or negative. Uh, but here, machines haven't learned yet to fully uh, understand, especially domain-specific data. So we kind of you know, looked at a bunch of different examples. Some of it is pretty good. For example, this was like the most positive statement, and this was a medical uh, uh, company. So this was like international spine, particularly in the dark markets, is doing well and growing better than in the recent quarters. And we had a positive Krypton uh, Hyphon quarter, and we're encouraged by that. When you put all of it together, particularly in the new product cadence in the US, we think it's a good pathway towards growing the US spine business. This was here. So this whole statement was sent and comprehended as positive. All the other ones raised to it as positive. So you can potentially use an ensemble approach, as you call it, and you basically see the same information for multiple APIs, and you can do a voting saying if most of them are saying positive, then I can rate it as positive. Uh, I didn't have to build a machine learning model, I just had to build an interface to these APIs. And then you can see some of the information here. Um, the most of them was negative. Uh, but you can also see, you know, if I look, ask Azure um, amongst all the statements, which one are you most confident about? And give me that statement which had the highest positive rating. And I, interestingly, Azure came up with the statement, pop up, it's great, thank you. Uh, that was like the best or the most confident statements. I mean, you know, that's where there's option, there's uh, definitely scope for data cleansing too. Uh, so you wanna kind of, you know, when you talk to companies and startups, uh, you know, my perspective, you know, the reason why I wanted to have D, you know, uh, you know, when I'm being invited to today and yesterday was, you know, uh, especially in the context of FinTech, you wanna kind of understand both fronts. You know, you wanna kind of understand the, the, the fun part, the investing part, you know, who are the unicorns out there, who are the active players out there? How are these companies getting funded? Uh, what's all the activity and you know, all the fun stuff which you love to hear about? But you also want to kind of get under the hood and understand like what are the products? What are the challenges? Like how are they building these products? What are the challenges companies face as entrepreneurs? And every entrepreneur has a story to tell because they're working at this level, right? You may see a factor at the end and you may say, well, I'm paying for this particular service, but if you get under the herd, you're basically paying for some of this, right? So you really need to evaluate, well, is this the state of the art? And you're putting this and deploying it and replacing humans in some places and making decisions based on information. Are we ready yet to make those decisions? And those are all important questions we have to think about. Right? Every software company I've uh, spoken to, uh, they'll have a story to tell about. What's your biggest challenge? There's a lot of data, it's not clean, it's not labeled. So what do you do about that? Oh, we are outsourcing that. So where are you outsourcing it to? Well, 
cost, wherever the cost is low, I can't hire a $150,000 earning data scientist to come in and cleanse my data. They're going to be bored and they're not going to do it. So I need to figure out a way in which it has to be labeled, otherwise I can't use any of these models. So there are a lot of practical challenges. And there's a lot of VC money going into funding the interfaces, funding, you know, anybody can build a really cool interfaces with the web technology which is out there. They can build those connections. They can build the platforms and say, we do have a platform where you put in, uh, give in your data, you do this and we'll give you a nice report. But as end users, the value has to be realized in terms of what does that report do for you in your enterprise. Um, so there's a lot of uh, skepticism in the financial industry when you're thinking about our option of these products. Uh, we already went through the whole big data phenomenon. You know, we tracked the big data phenomenon three or four years ago. Everybody wanted to be a big data issue. Everybody wanted to learn big data. Everybody wanted to understand how to do it. And you saw how Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR, how these companies kind of you know, became giants and then how they shrunk themselves. Uh, the same thing is going to happen to big data, uh, uh, AI and machine learning. We are seeing a lot of activity, but then you know, some of the key players who are really adding value kind of you know, bubble up and you're going to see a graveyard of a lot of companies who may not have value saved in that as well. Um, so I want to end this uh, session with a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, uh, the reason why this is an interesting place is we are going to see a lot more AI and machine learning products come into our lives. That's the fact of life. You know, we are seeing a lot of innovation and we are going to see all these products. And finance is going to pick up and you know, uh, operationalize many of these technologies. Uh, so please be aware of it. If you don't know how to do it, please, please, please do not just take a Python class and say, okay, now I'm ready to build a machine learning product. Um, you know, hire the right talent. You know, it's easier to kind of you know have the next hire be a machine learning or a data scientist to augment your team rather than you can know how difficult would it be? You know, I can use a lawnmower, I can operate the refrigerator, I can also learn Python and build my own machine learning models. And uh, now that should not be the approach, at least in this area, because there's a lot to learn, a lot to do. Please get the right talent to in order to uh, kind of uh, so build out your expertise when you're adopting AI and machine learning. So um, I will end it for the day. Tomorrow we're going to talk about um, wealth management and banking. Talk a little bit about some of the robot advisors, planning products, um, and then we'll also have Darsha talk about you know fintech you know, from a from an India perspective. I told you uh, yesterday, Darsha was my student six years ago at Babson, and uh, he worked for a couple of companies, and then he went back to India and he set up a data science consultancy. And uh, he has this, you know, on the ground knowledge about like what's happening, what are the various challenges, what are the various options out there. He's going to bring in his perspective there. Uh, so sharp eleven thirty tomorrow. Let's meet and continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.